Thanks, Morris. Um, so one, object one objective of, uh, of plant phenotyping is to better understand the fundamental biological processes that control plant development and growth. It's challenging because plant phenotype is the result of well, genetic, physiological, biomechanical factors that are all under the influence of the environment. So at the um, Al Algorithmic Botany Lab at the University of Calgary, we are using computer models and software to help us, uh, sorry. All right. So at the Algorithmic Botany Lab at the University of Calgary, we are using computer models and software to help us enhance our mechanistic understanding of how plants grow. Uh, we are also using these models to um, identify gaps in this understanding, which may lead us to sharpen questions for further biological experiments. From a practical point of view, these models and understanding can help us to build decision support systems or maybe identify traits that plant breeders could target for in different environmental conditions. So one particularly mo motivating example is of Brassica oleracea. So in this species, uh, many of the cultivars in this species are derived from, well, from, the, from wild cabbage, and they have very different morpholo morphological traits. So for example, there's cabbage, kale, broccoli, or cauliflower, even Romanesco, and uh, other, uh, other varieties. But of course, phenotype is not just the result of genetic expression. In kiwi fruit, for example, well, it's a climbing plant in the wild that climbs trees, but in the orchard it is extensively managed, so it takes a much different form. So the question is, how do you represent, or the, well, first, uh, yes, the, what I want to talk about today is how we model the architecture of a plant on a computer, how we can inter integrate genetic regulation into that model, or phys the f physiological aspects, how, these, how we can simulate the interaction of the plant with the environment, uh, maybe integrate some biomechanical simulations, and then finally apply these models to help train neural networks, which we just saw Steve was talking about. So how do we represent a plant in a computer? The most widely used approach was first proposed by uh, Lindenmeyer in 1968. So he developed a mathematical notation for describing how a plant grows um, while he was studying the development of multicellular organisms. What this gives you is a way to capture the dynamic, the dynamic structure of the plant as it develops. And also, the mathematical notation can then be translated into computer programming language, which is then the basis for simulation software. So in, a, in an L system, the plant is broken down into several components, and each of these components can be represented by a symbol like a, like a letter. So for instance, the apex will be represented, the growing tip would be represented by the symbol A. The auxiliary bud could be represented by a symbol B a leaf by L, and internode by I. And then the, as the modeler, you just specify what the behavior is of all of these different components. So we write that in the, in the notation by saying that A, the growing apex, is replaced by, well, it produces a metamer. So it produces a new internode, a new leaf, a new auxiliary bud, and recreates the apex. The advantage is that you can actually input these rules directly into a computer and simulate the development of, of a plant. So if we were to start with some initial structure of just a growing tip um, and, and applied this rule, then the, a, a, a different structure would, uh, would develop, or the plant structure would develop. Okay, now we can use these L systems to help us study um, the diversity of plant architecture we see in nature. So as an example, I want to start with, with uh, the diversity of inflorescences. So if we take that simple L system I just described and specify that the behavior of lateral apices is to produce a terminal flower, then we can model inflorescences that we see in foxglove or lupin. And now I can actually show you a simulation since I, I have a computer here.
And since, since this is a model on a computer, you can rotate or zoom in to look at um, some of the p uh, particulars of the, of the plant. Okay, uh, uh, another common type of inflorescences is a sign. So here, essentially, instead of, um, essentially the main apex terminates in a flower, the lateral apices produce branches, and those terminate in flowers, and so on, and so on, and so on. Naturally, these models are built of many different parameters, so some of them I have um, I'm displaying here on the left side. And if we change the parameters, we can actually change the architecture and change the phenotype of this plant. So for instance, I'm just going to shorten the internodes. Okay, so we get a very sm smaller looking plant. Yes, and there, there are many other parameters. For instance, Steve was mentioning the importance of flowering time. That's, that's one of the parameters, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to canola. And in, in this case, the L system is modified so that the uh, lateral apices produce secondary branching, which then terminates in flowering. And eventually, the main, uh, the main raceme, as, as the lateral apices on the main A uh, main racing produce flowers and eventually the the uh, a terminal flower one important aspect of uh, canopy architecture in canola is the the angle of the branching of the secondary branches so that more light can penetrate deeper into the canopy to help the seeds develop. So we can see what that phenotype would look like well, by, mod by modifying the branching angle. And similarly to before, I can change the length of the internodes to develop some kind of a dwarf phenotype of canola. And this model is fully developmental still. So if I rewind the simulation and run again. Or not. OK, so you don't know what happened there? I'll just keep going. Now we can use these different phenotypes to help study the architecture of the canopy by looking at or examining the spatial and temporal organization of the organs, the timing of flowering, or the control of branching. So here are two small plots. One is the kind of original canola model I showed you, and one is this dwarf phenotype that I just produced. However, we all know that uh, branching is controlled by genotypes, so we would like to incorporate some kind of genetic regulatory network into these models. If we look at biological experiments in, uh, yes, if we look at biological experiments in Arabidopsis, oops, sorry, um, there's a diversity of mutant and transgenic, transgenic phenotypes. So, um, in, compared to the compared to the wild type. We can have phenotypes with um, less branching that uh, produce a flower very early on in development, or much more branching, even to the point where the plant is just branching and doesn't even produce any flowers. So we took a there, we took a descriptive model of Arabidopsis, which well all of the all of the parameters in the model were based on measurements of the actual plant as it develops over time, and incorporated a model of gen genetic regulation regulation into that descriptive model. So essentially, the expression of the terminal flower 1 gene 
delays the switch to flowering, whereas the leafy gene promotes the switch to flowering or accelerates the switch to flowering. And these two, these two genes act antagonistically with each other. And so by doing that, we can actually simulate some of these, or most of these uh, mutant and transgenic phenotypes that we observe in the biological experiments. In particular, compared to the wild type, early flowering with not much branching, and then much more flowering and even, even more flowering. Or, sorry, more branching and even more branching. But, uh, right, and then, right, okay, and then another aspect, another way to use the model is to study how, how it behaves in different uh, environments. So in this case, we're looking at the fitness landscape where fitness being the chance of the plant to, to survive from one season to the next. If, there is, uh, if we change the duration of growth and the uh, duration of the growth season and the variability, uh, variability of that growth season, season, whether it's fixed or whether it's highly variable. So in the first case, if there's a long season and it's very fixed, that the duration of growth is uh, fixed, you get well, kind of the best architecture to have is a lot of branching and eventually to produce terminal flowers. But if you have a short season that's very variable, then that's not, a good, that's not a good architecture because you have a very low fitness, you have a very low chance of survival. So it turns out that a better architecture is, well, what we observe in nature. Uh, either raceme-like inflorescence or cyan-like inflorescence. Okay, so the combination of genetic, regu uh, the combination of an architectural model and a genetic regu regulatory model is that we can begin to examine how these phenotypes would behave in different environments. But genetics aren't the only aspect that we like to include in models. There's also, um, well, physiological aspects that are an important factor in uh, phenotypic diversity. So in this model of, of a peach tree, um, uh, there's a an aspect which models the carbon transport from sources like leaves to sinks like fruit. And in this case, the simulation was looking at how, how fruit thinning strategies in peach trees can, can alter the size and um, number of fruit. So if we, do, if, we just let, if we leave a large number of fruit on the tree, then we get many fruit, about 36 fruits, and um, they're all pretty small. Whereas if we do some fruit thinning strategies, then there'll be less fruit, but they'll actually be bigger in terms of uh, grams of carbon. So this, this model was actually the basis for many other um, architectural models, including uh, an almond tree model, an apple tree model, and even a kiwi fruit vine model. But it also includes, it also includes uh, environmental factors, such as the light distribution inside the leaves to calculate photosynthesis so that you know, how much resources you have to allocate to different parts of the tree. Yes, which is obviously important in modeling phenotypic plasticity. And to do that in a computer, we combine the model of a plant with a model of the environment. These white arrows indicate that there's bidirectional flow of information between the two models, and that is to be able to simulate the reci reciprocal relationship between a plant and its environment. So there are many different environments environmental models available in the, in the software, and here are a few examples. So in particular, there's um, a simulation of plant-soil interaction, simulation of plant-light interaction, or simulating entire ecosystems like, well, metals of many different types of plants, or simulating the competition for space, which is important in the modeling of trees. But I'm going to talk about, uh, today I'm going to talk about plant-light interaction. So it's been observed that Portulaca boracea seedlings do not develop in the direction of their neighbors. They basically sense the amount of light, and if they, if they can sense a neighbor, they won't grow that way. So if we have a, a virtual plant model just growing in isolation, this plant will grow radially outwards and fill in the space. However, biological experiments suggest that Portulaca is able to sense the quality of light, the, ratio of red to far red light and able to detect the, and able to detect the, um, the presence of future shade or the, the presence of neighboring plants. 
So we can simulate that. Oh, so the, sorry, the, the biological experiment was basically to put this portulaca plant into a ring with one side colored green and the other side colored gray. And you can see then, well, we can observe that the plant grows mostly in the, towards the, the gray part of the ring. So that is, we can simulate that in the computer as well, whereas now the, the APCs of, the, of this growing virtual plant can detect the quality of light that's coming. So basically they detect the ratio of red to far red light and they won't grow towards anything that's reflecting that near infrared um, spectrum. And if you, flip, if you flip the green side of the ring, then the plant, will, well the virtual plant will grow in the other direction. And then if you combine two of these plants side by side and artificially separate them apart, then we see that the plants grow, the virtual plant grows away from its neighbor. Right. These type of simulations can be used to help understand innovative management systems. So for example, in, um, in New Zealand, the most innovative growers uh, experiment with different support structures or they try to grow secondary canopies underneath the primary one, or they even use reflective ground covers. So we can visualize the effect of these ground covers using a model of a kiwi fruit. So if there is no reflective ground cover, then you can see that the red color indicates that there isn't that much light reaching the understory of the, of the canopy. But if we put in a virtual reflective ground cover, then there's an overall more distribution of light inside the canopy. And this can be used as a basis to help us understand how reflective ground covers will change the photosynthetic efficiency of the plant. Okay, so I'm gonna switch a little bit to a more methodological advancement that we have, um, that we have made. So obviously there's a large phenotypic diversity in plants and inflorescences are a very good example of that diversity. So here are models of several different lilac inflorescences. And if you were to zoom in on, well, if you were to zoom in on these models, you would, you, you would see that the petals are actually penetrating through each other. So we're essentially ignoring that collisions are ignored between f the petals of the florets. But, th but thanks to recent advancements in the field of uh, computer graphics and animation, we can actually resolve these collisions, or we'll detect these collisions and resolve them so that we have a much more realistic looking model of the inflorescence, at least the petals of the inflorescence. But we also extended this method so that we can simulate the development of these inflorescences or the opening of the florets. Cool. And we also incorporated these um, this, this, method, this method into our L system programming language so that we can take the existing, an existing model, turn collisions on, and everything will be handled automatically. So I forgot to show you the model of canola. I'll just go back. So here's a, a simulation of about six canola plants growing together and all of the leaves push each other apart and none of the branches of, this, of these plants grow through leaves. So we can, we can do this with canola, and we can also do this with other plants. For instance, fields of, fields of tulips. And, and there are many other models, but uh, in, in addition, thanks to this methodological advancement, we can simulate biomechanical um, aspects of plant development that change the shape of the, of the plant. So for instance, gravity or the increase in mass of fruit will cause these, uh, these, be these um, stems to bend. And now, all of these models are not only important for human observers, they're actually also useful for training uh, com uh, computer neural networks in image-based phenotyping tasks. So we've already sh we've shown, actually Steve talked about the Steve talked about this task already, basically to count leaves in Arabidopsis rosettes. And we've shown that you can augment the annotated training data set by using models to, well, generate ground truth data. Because if we use a model, 
if we use a model to generate these synthetic images, we know exactly how many leaves there are already because we generated the, 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 the visualization. And importantly, we show that between the photographs um, and the synthetic images, uh, we can use well. We can use either the photographs to train the the neural network and test it on the synthetic images, or the vice versa. Use the use the uh, synthetic images to train the neural network and test it on the photographs. So essentially, there's an interoperability between photographs and the synthetic images. Now we want to take these. Now we want to take these um, this training of neural networks from just individual plants to entire, well, plots of canola, and, and use it to help, uh, well, to generate annotated data for the individual numbers of flowers in these plots, or maybe the numbers of flowers, or sorry, the numbers of plants. Okay, so I've given you an overview of how we use computational modeling to help understand plant phenotyping, and I've highlighted some applications in genotype to phenotype mapping for Arabidopsis plants, uh, the design of efficient canopy architecture in canola or peach trees, what the effect of plant light interac interaction is in portulaca plants or kiwi fruit vines, and the use of these models in the generation of ground truth data. So, and before finishing, I just want to acknowledge the um, other members of the University of Calgary lab, especially the, the head of the lab, Premislav Prusinkevich, and all of our collaborators from PERC and abroad. Thanks very much. <laughs>